Welcome to Catholic Ed for All, your weekly insight into topics of special education in Catholic schools. My name is Dr. Raul Escarpio, and I invite you to join me each week as we learn how to be more inclusive in Catholic schools and continue to live out St. John Paul II's message of open wide the doors to Christ. Many thanks go out to RCL Benzinger, who is generously sponsoring this podcast. RCL Benzinger enriches the worldwide Catholic community by providing the most engaging and highest quality resources, programs, and services rooted in the rich and diverse tradition of the Catholic faith. And now, on to our show. On the show today, I am joined by Mr. John Garrow, Principal of Central Catholic High School in Portland, Oregon. Why, hello, John. Welcome to the show, and thanks for being here. Hello, Raul, and I really appreciate you having me. Uh, thanks for joining me. John, can you please tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. I am, as you said, Principal of Central Catholic High School, Portland, Oregon. I am in my 10th year now as Principal at Central Catholic. Uh, prior to that, I spent 36 years in public education as both a classroom teacher for 21 years and as a assistant principal for the last five. So I'm finishing up my 36th year uh, in education, and I was a social studies teacher for a long time. Uh, parent, uh, two daughters in their 20s. Uh, yeah, that's me. Two dogs. There you go. Two dogs. Two dogs. <laughs> Fantastic. So I always ask uh, all my guests, what level did you teach at? I taught uh, high school uh, and taught what we called American studies, global studies, government, uh, economics, primarily. Fantastic. Fantastic. So what does the job of a principal look like at Central Catholic? What does a common day or a normal day look like? Not, not that anything's normal in, in school, but what, what would it look like at Central Catholic? Gosh, yeah. So uh, let's see. Uh, this week is a little different because it's final exam week. But in a normal week, um, we I would be starting my day typically at 730 if I can uh, hit the chapel, uh, I can start with a, a quick uh, before school mass. Uh, then I would head towards the front door to see people coming in and out. If I didn't have a parent meeting or a teacher meeting, uh, eight o'clock we'd start classes. And um, I would probably try to crank out some emails, um, check in with my president. Uh, down the hall, and uh, otherwise then I would begin to make rounds. Uh, going through, I have a, a few classrooms I, I love to check in on, uh, and in particular I would love to check in on our Monsignor, uh, Father, Father Murphy, Monsignor Tim Murphy, who's been here, believe it or not, uh, 51 years in education. Wow. Oh yeah, it's, I mean, he's amazing. Uh, and then Pretty much, I, uh, you know, the life of the principal is that that doors open and and it's a uh, revolving <laughs> most of the day. And, and people are in and out. So to to save myself, I'll get up and uh, and meet people where they are. Typically, I love to get into the classrooms and poke my head in and, and see what kind of education our kids are getting that day. So speaking of your of your kids, uh, for those that don't know anything about Central Catholic. Tell me about the size of the school and what kind of what kind of students you service. Sure. So uh, if you don't know Portland, um, or even if you do, we are uh, a southeast neighborhood school. So we are uh, we were uh, established in 1939 by then Archbishop uh, Howard uh, as uh, an archdiocesan school for boys. And if you remember Catholic education. In the in the 30s uh, and the 40s, the first graduating class was 1942, and it was I believe 17 uh, students, and it grew to an all boys school, uh, huge in the 60s. Uh, we went co-ed at Central Catholic in the early 1980s, as enrollment had dwindled to fewer than 400 students, and so today we are at 860 students, co-ed. Uh, we are 
35% um, students of color, 65% Caucasian. Um, yeah, so we, we pretty much, uh, we get students from a huge geographic area. We have about 70 feeding schools this year in our student body. Students come from, from all over the place, and, but mainly in the Port, Portland metro area, Vancouver, Washington, Beaverton, if you've heard of that, uh, Gresham, surrounding areas of Portland. So it's, it's a really robust program you have going on there. It's, yeah, we, we do serve a, a, a great group of, of students. About 51 to 52 percent of our student body receives financial aid or assistance to attend here. So we're pretty, uh, we cover a pretty wide continuum of economic uh, classes also. So, you know, some who get a full, almost an entire full ride and others who can pay their way plus donate extra. So it's very interesting. Uh, demographic. So, you know, I, I would be remiss if I wasn't, if I was interviewing a principal of a Catholic school and I didn't ask about their football program. How do you guys do in football? Well, we have an excellent football program. This year we lost in the quarterfinals, unfortunately. Uh, two years ago we played in the state final and unfortunately didn't come out on top. We won a couple of uh, state championships consecutive years, uh, 14 and 15. Uh, we're pretty, we are very competitive in the state of Oregon uh, in football. 860 kids, but we play at the highest uh, enrollment level. Fantastic. Congrats on that. So yeah. l let's talk about the in uh, inclusive practices at Central Catholic High School. You were telling me about the makeup of your students. Uh, do you have any inclusive uh, programs at your school or students? We do. So uh, I was really fortunate uh, four years ago to hire uh, our first director of diversity and inclusion. His name is David Blue. Uh, but prior to that, we were being inclusive in the uh, academic area. So starting, uh, I was hired in 2009 and 2010 and did an assessment of how we were meeting students' needs academically. Uh, in particular with an eye towards uh, special needs populations and students with learning differences and, and disabilities and hired um, our first student services coordinator the following year. Uh, that, so that would have been 2010-11, so nine years ago. And since that time, we've been expanding our um, the spectrum of students that we can serve and the learning needs of our students. And so we have gone from pretty much a standard traditional, here's the bar you need to meet uh, academically to be, become a member of our student body, uh, to being able to serve students with a pretty wide variety of learning challenges. I, I looked and got some data for you today, Raul, and out of 100, uh, or out of 860 students, we are now serving 110 students who would qualify for, um, if they were in a public school, would qualify for special education services. Fantastic. That's a lot of students you have at that school that, that are that are in an inclusive program or or require inclusive services. Yeah, we're we're pretty wise. So, and you know, and the range goes from students who need uh, simply uh, we have uh, what we call power hour after school where they can go in for an hour and uh, take their planner with them and check in with the, the teacher who's monitoring power hour and and um, get a sign off that they're, you know, keeping track of their assignments and they got tests coming up all the way to uh, taking uh, one of the curricular options that we've created, uh, like a, uh, an algebra support class or a freshman language arts support class. So we really have a wide range of services. Some need just check-ins and others need really uh, more significant interventions. We also um, have a new program that we have nicknamed the RAMS program, which is our mascot, that serves students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that program is now in its third year. 
So you, you, you service students that have intellectual needs, and I'll, and I'll touch on that in a second, but your other students basically are uh, students that have learning differences, learning disabilities, any students, any students with autism at your school or just learning disabilities? Oh, yes, we have, we have served several students uh, who are on the spectrum. Uh, some, yeah, some who've done amazingly well in their AP courses. They've gotten fives, uh, you know, and it's been a real amazing experience for our uh, staff to, to see that happen, too. Uh, and, and where are they placed or not located, but are they, do they have their own uh, areas to work in? Or are they part of the the student population take classes with them? Does it depend on the need? Uh, run me through some just quick parameters on their on their schooling. Sure. So um, our overall goal is to be inclusive. Okay. And so, you know, and, and again, we feel inclusion is really grounded in, in the Catholic faith and in Catholic social teaching. So our goal is to include every student we possibly can with their peers in a classroom. So, like I said, some of our students haven't been able to manage advanced placement curriculum, and others, uh, some with intellectual and developmental uh, delays, uh, we still include in classes, but we use a, um, a peer mentor system for them. So we have um, uh, this continuum that is really broad, uh, but for the most part, uh, the default setting is students are included in regular education classrooms. Um, that's sort of our, our starting point. And then there are some, for example, our, our uh, RAMS program students that we've created uh, this year in particular. Some students have business math and they have um, uh, workforce development class uh, where they can, uh, we've started a school-based business and so those students are taking part with uh, their peer mentors in a school-based business during their workforce development period. So that's a really exciting development as well. Let's, so. let's touch on that because if you're doing work development, that, that really perks my ears because it's very similar to what happens in public schools when they develop a, a business model in the school. I, I take it that's what you're going with, John? Is that right? Uh, right. What are they working? I, so yeah, so I was fortunate enough to bring that experience with me uh, in a in a large comprehensive public high school where I saw a pretty you know full and robust special education department. So so what <clears throat> what uh, we were, were able to create here uh, in our school based business, we have a coffee and snack cart business. Fantastic. That just getting off the ground this year. Oh my gosh. Well, it's been a blessing. Uh, donors have really smiled upon us um, this year in this program, and, and they love the idea. So um, on the side, a piece, piece of my little background, I love coffee. It's a Northwest, <laughs> it's a Northwest thing, right? Right. And I taught myself to, to, be, to roast coffee at home, and then I was able to get into a uh, a local uh, businessman here, and he allows me to use his commercial roaster. So we started with some coffee that I roasted, um, and the students came up with a name. They came up with their own logo design. Uh, it's been so awesome to watch them. And then we bought some coffee equipment, and right now it's nothing super fancy. We um, are brewing coffee right now, and they can also make hot cocoa or tea. And they're toasting bagels, taking orders uh, from <clears throat> teachers, and then they'll uh, go around with the peer mentor. And some of them are a little more independent, and they don't need the help. Uh, and they'll deliver the the coffee order to the teacher. And it's been really exciting to watch uh, students kind of navigate that. Uh, soon we haven't uh, we haven't got into money yet, but we're I have a believe it or not I have a student in our computer science class uh, who has developed an app so that our teachers and our students can order through an app. Wow. And it's, I know, it's, uh, so we're, 
we've expanded uh, kind of the reach to some of the regular ed classrooms and the student who's developing the app is just so excited about it. And, and uh, what? And if I can touch up on what John's saying, um, we call that the functional curriculum for students with intellectual disabilities. It does no good just to educate them and just give them a handshake at graduation and say, thanks for joining us. I, I know John appreciates that. We kind of, we want to show them how to succeed in this world so they're not a burden to anyone and doing coffee carts the way John's school is doing at Central Catholic. And I've seen it done where they sell Otis Spunkmeyer cookies. And I've seen it done where they sell uh, in Miami Cuban bread, you know, and, and they do things. So they're learning how to handle currency. I know you're not there yet. But even just monopoly money, so they know, you know, cause and effect, and 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 they know how to translate uh, and generalize money into another setting. That's huge, John. I I know you understand that, but it's just it's it's huge what's going on, and it also allows a lot of social opportunities. I gather between your students with disabilities and your typical kids. Oh yeah, the communication growth. Um, I think some of the parents, you know, would be really good at giving testimony here because the what, what they've noticed more than anything that interaction that you're talking about rule has has led to these tremendous bursts in communication uh from in particular we have three downs syndrome students mm -hmm. uh that we're delivering and their their language has just taken off you know they're they're using language and they're using sentence structures and they're communicating so much better uh, because they're with their peers almost all day long and they're and they're interacting so often they're constantly in community and in conversation um, to and so that growth is just uh, it's amazing and the coffee cart gives that real specific purposeful kind of a conversation and you know I just to piggyback on what you said um, the idea of, of this is it's best practice, first of all, because it, um, it allows students to begin transition goals and tran transition goal setting, um, which happens in a public setting, you know, at the sophomore year typically or at age 16. So they're, they're being educated and they're, they're setting academic goals, but they're also then able to focus and to begin looking at transition and community goals and they're able to see what skills they really have in those areas so it's, it's been a, a real nice uh, addition to what we're doing it, it's basically uh, as simple as it can sound you're including them in, in in a nutshell you're including all your students and making sure that all of them feel part of the of the school community so i mean kudos to you john thank you for yeah. for doing that so oh, yeah. one of my uh, couple questions I have, let's, let's say you know a, a, pr um, a principal, not in Portland, but close by, and is looking at what you're doing there, maybe not with the coffee cart, and they have a small school, and maybe they're, they, they want to start including students with differences, students with disabilities. Can you just reach out to them and just tell the audience real quick, just one simple advice to try to get the ball rolling in their school? If, at, a, at, a, at a high school level to try to include students that are not typical learners? Well, I would say uh, a couple of things. One, one is a uh, piece of advice is um, you're, you're never ready, but you're always ready. And, and that sounds, yeah. it sounds, but it, it, I was nervous and I and I wanted to run before I could walk and so I made sure I took it slowly but uh, if you're waiting for that perfect moment for your community to, to do a new program for example we're a college prep school why would we do this exactly you know, sending kids to college forever and being very successful but the, uh, the community isn't complete until you include all the members and so uh, my my suggestion is try it, uh, build that culture of inclusion, uh, it, it, you, you'll be, um, I think, really strengthened and buoyed in your, in your own, I think the faith in particular, uh, it is so Catholic to include these students in the community because they're there and our, our core mission families, our Catholic families, 
have students who traditionally aren't aren't able to access Catholic education. And you will be, um, I think your your plate will overflow with um, good feelings about how you're advancing the Catholic mission of the schools by just including more families than you think you can serve right now. Yeah, and, uh, and John, I want to say amen. my opening message. Amen is right. Amen is right, brother. And and I want to say that what people might think is might be lacking in their school is going to be multiplied with the graces that God gives you for including, as you say, all members of the community. I'm, I'm going to steal the part when you said that um, the community is not complete until you include everyone. So, I mean, and that's, an, that's a big amen in capital letters. So, John, before I go... Last question, and I think you started talking about it. What should Catholic special education look like? Oh, gosh. My vision? Yes, fly in the sky. Uh, <laughs> my vision for Catholic education is that there is a place for, for every student uh, who wants to attend, for every Catholic student in particular who wants to attend a Catholic school, there is a place for them. That's, that's my big picture vision. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's like sending a man to the moon, but, uh, and it's a big resource uh, question, which I know, and it's a challenge, but I think uh, to be truly Catholic, to be universal, to be inclusive of, of everyone in the community, I think it's, it's upon all of us to do our best to find what our community can do to include as many people who really want to be part of a Catholic community. I think that uh, everyone's going to benefit from that. So Catholic special education, I think in particular college, we send kids to college, we send them on to careers, we create civic leaders, and we are only going to create a better, uh, more Catholic civic leader if we give them opportunities to, to be inclusive in their in their schooling so my my vision for uh catholic special ed is that we involve uh students in our schools and then we involve all of their peers uh not setting them aside in separate programs or separate classrooms but including them in all the regular ed classrooms that we possibly can that's my vision amen john amen john i want to thank you for joining me today it has been my Pleasure to see the growth that your your school is demonstrating in inclusive education. I I wish you nothing but prayers and blessings as, as you continue to advance God's mission to include all. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate talking. Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for this week. If this podcast was a blessing to you, can you please head over to iTunes and subscribe and give us a review or a rating? It really does help other Catholic educators find the podcast and use it as a resource. Thanks again to the amazing people at RCL Benziger for generously sponsoring this podcast. Check out their new resource for Catholic schools, Blessed Are We, Faith in Action, which enables teachers to share the love of Christ with children who have special needs. Visit rclbenziger.com to learn more. Join me again next time as we continue to advance God's kingdom by including all of God's children in Catholic schools and faith formation. Until then, this is Dr. Raul Escarpio. Thanks for listening, and may God bless your day.